ladies and gentlemen. Delighted to be here with you this morning. Um, for the first time in my career, I'm convinced that our industry is undergoing fundamental technological change. Uh, it's driven by the exponential growth of technologies such as clean energy, uh, microwave and plasma preconditioning of rock, data science, 3D printing, medical imaging, the list goes on. Anglo-American is well positioned to take advantage of these opportunities. We're a globally diversified mining company. We operate 37 assets across three continents. We have 87,000 employees. And our primary commodities are copper, platinum, diamonds, iron ore, nickel, thermal and met coal. 2017 is our centenary year and we're celebrating 100 years in business and have a rich heritage of technology and innovation. At Anglo-American, we believe that to be truly innovative requires an entirely new paradigm, one that integrates existing mining technologies with these new disruptive digital and energy technologies that are already with us. We don't know exactly how the uh, technologi technological revolution will pan out, but one thing is clear, that today's pioneers will be the winners of the future. And for Anglo-American, we're already undergoing the first steps. Firstly, what are we trying to solve for? In 1900, to mine 40 kilograms of copper, we mined two tonnes of rock, we used three cubic metres of water and 10 kilowatt hours of energy. Today, even though we've scaled up in equipment and efficiency uh, beyond belief, we now mine 16 times more rock, we use twice the amount of water and we use 16 times more energy. Now clearly that footprint is no longer sustainable. And although I think the, the industry, um, the efficiency is implied, I think the industry needs to start thinking of precision. How do we precisely mine the 40 kilograms of copper and leave behind all the the other inputs that are creating incredible footprint and waste issues. One day we will be able to do that. When it will happen, we're not sure. But at Anglo-American, we believe that a pathway is starting to open up in this, in this sense, and we're taking the first steps towards the day when mining will be entirely different. Firstly, our approach. We've used an open forum approach, and to date we've had uh, five open forums. Our first one was on sustainability. We've had processing, mining, energy, and more recently, geology. We've got one coming up next year on the future of work. These open forums have been quite deliberately crafted. Uh, we've used less than 50% of particip participants from the industry. Um, we've gone to the automobile industry, the food industry, oil and gas. Uh, we've had people from Hollywood basically trying to, to, to latch on to the most innovative uh, people in the world. Out of the first four forums, we got over 6,000 ideas. We've taken those 6,000 ideas down into 12 basic themes which we're working through. The approach is also, we've redefined the way that we work. Um, we've taken all these programs onto 90 day cycles. So every 90 days, the program has got to either make a decision one way or the other. It either pivots, it stops, or it goes forward, but there's a decision. And what that's introduced into the whole program is absolute speed. We're making progress today that we wouldn't have seen possible even 18 months ago. The, uh, the other part in this is that we've introduced uh, across the organisation what we call smart box. 
just talked about Smart Path, where we've engaged the organisation uh, with basically a venture capital approach, trying to, to, to generate uh, smart ideas out of the organisation. And we've seen some particularly good uh, ideas come through, particularly in the area of sustainability. Uh, one key part of our approach is we haven't looked for IP. Uh, we, we're looking for speed of implementation. Um, and we are trying to position ourselves for our key partners as their pathway to market. So what have we seen to date? What has, have been some of the key programs? You concentrate the mind process integrates a number of technologies. And the first one that I'll talk about is the concentrated mind. And at the centre is, is what we call coarse particle recovery. It allows us to float the minerals at sizes two to three times larger than normal. And it's got two, two fundamental benefits. It loses, uses far less energy and can therefore increase our production rates. And secondly, we're able to more easily extract water from the process, leaving a waste stream that is dry and stackable. To date, we've seen some quite outstanding results at our pilot plants in Chile. Early indicators show us that we can achieve 30% more throughput, using 20% less energy, and only losing 3% recovery. Not every ore body in the world can do this, but what this will fundamentally do is it'll change the copper co uh, cost curve. And uh, you know we're basically at the front of this. We're also seeing this potentially applicable to our platinum industry, and we're extending our pilot uh, process into this at this point in time. We're also uh, to, to to optimally liberate ores, clearly the coarse particle, all particles, getting precision in the, in the size is really important. We're developing with partners in Germany a new uh, high-speed tertiary crushers, very different to what's available on the market, to fragment particles using 30% less energy than conventional means. It will redesign process, process uh, oh, sorry, comminution at the front end of the, the process. We're also developing new techniques to classify particle sizes, preventing unnecessary regrinding and providing a better material for flotation. Again, that's got another energy saving of 30% potential. Bulk ore sorting, another one. Using pre-concentration technology, again, to be able to expand our plants basically without the same capital footprint that we've used historically. Again, less energy. There's a theme to all this. Clearly it's around footprint, it's around energy, it's around water, and basically making our business very, very competitive. So we talk about this using less water, but what if we simply use no water at all? And that picture there shows uh, what we call dry water. If you put your hand in this and move it around, it sloshes like water, it feels like water, you take your hand out and it's dry. That's the future of water in mining. We won't be using water, quite frankly. And the pathways that we're basically opening up are heading us in this direction. Another area that we're using in the, in the water, we're using polymers. We've actually developed a technique that we're now putting into our diamond business where we use polymers to basically remove the solids from the water Again, this will allow us to dry stack out our tailings. The coarse particle flotation it, uh, leads us to a pathway where water releases out of the material. If you picture a talcum powder with water in it, you get a sludge that you can't get your water out of. If you coarsen the particles to some point, the water comes out. One day, we will have an industry without tailings dams. So the incidents that you've seen over the last few years will no longer happen. We'll be at the forefront of leading that into the industry. On the mining side, uh, clearly underground mines are challenged in terms of, of both safety and, and cost. 
Um, we're already rock cutting with hard rock in, in our, our platinum mines in South Africa. Um, it will, can revolutionise basically the industry where you no longer need the traditional drill and, and explosives that we have today. The testing has gone very well and we're currently putting microwaves on, onto preconditioning the cutters and we see that this is fundamentally changing the safety and speed in the industry. Um, ultimately, we'll put the crushing technology that we talked about behind our cutters, we'll do a lot of the processing underground, so the industry that, that, that everybody currently knows uh, will be unrecognisable. But let's return to the challenge of precision. And what we have here are, are, are bots. The future of mining, these are the future miners. They won't be humans with, with cap lamps. They will basically be these bots. We're exploring these disruptive technologies today. Uh, and basically the development process in this area is, is, is actually exceeding what I expected. It sounds like science fiction, but these bots will basically go underground. They'll be self-learning. They'll be small, uh, basically uh, leading to low cost. They'll be self-learning. They will require much less infrastructure than the current mines that we have today. Sounds like science fiction? Well, it's not. We've already got it to a point where the chiselling efficiency is equivalent to a human being today. So this is not so far off. It's probably only five to seven years away before you'll have this in some, some operations. Picture being able to turn vast quantities of data into insight about the probability of future events. This is the vision between, behind our intelligent mind, a digital transformation that consolidates existing data, interrogates the data using advanced analytics and machine learning al algorithms to reveal new patterns. We already are working in this space and we particularly see the ore body and process plants as the sweet spots to pursue, more so than, than automation. Today we're already using analytics for real-time drilling analysis, hyperspectral core imaging, and geological modelling using 3D and virtual reality to generate and interpret predictive data sets. An example of this is we, we, we needed to log some core. This core would have taken geologists about six months to do. We needed the results in a hurry. We programmed uh, an imaging piece of a kit to, to, uh, to log the core. It took us a week. Uh, an hour and a half to write the program, a week to consolidate the data, and the core was logged in an hour, much more precisely than a human being could do. We're also in our copper ore bodies use, using the hyperspectral imaging to, in the, in the ground, basically tag the characteristics of the ore, the hardness, the mineralogy, and it will lead us to a point where we know what's in the ground, we'll have, we'll have um, uh, measuring devices on the equipment that mines it, we'll be able to track the mineral as it goes from deep in the earth, basically right through the processing plants. And using medical imaging type equipment, be able to have real-time processing plants that are of a totally different design and flexibility to what we can currently imagine. In our daily world, um, we're working in this space at all levels, whether it's work management, um, whether it's in the monitoring of equipment, we're already working in this space. In the work management, we're putting a lot of effort into the planning of work, uh, being able to basically, uh, using real-time data, uh, monitor the, the outputs, the compliance to plan, and basically put those into analyse and improve loops so that we're continually improving it. The airline industry that you're aware of, 
I mean, when they buy an aeroplane, the engine's supplied by Rolls-Royce or somebody else, and as part of that package, there is real-time monitoring of the performance of the engine, basically by the use of, of digital twins. We've now basically put the same process into our operations. We've got digital twins now into our offshore mining ships. We're using it on some of our major pipelines, we're using it in smelters, and we're using it in our haulage fleet. And using those digital twins, we can basically look at the patterns of performance against basically theory, and when they start to diverge, intervene in some form. That's already with us, we're already doing it. And basically, this is the pathway to the mining industry starting to have uh, levels of availability, very, very reliability, very similar to the aircraft industry. Again, this is a very, very major change for the industry. Where other industries have put this in, but they've basically seen a 20% um, productivity improvement and a 15% reduction in cost. I think the real exciting piece to this is that the insights that we get out of this, the changes that we'll be able to make to the industry will be beyond what we can envision today. We can't sit in this room and imagine what the industry is going to look like because it is so changing so much. I think the learnings that we get out of the previous slide that I showed you will enable us to redesign the equipment, redesign the basic whole flow of our business and will take us down this precision pathway that is very, very different, but quite frankly, uh, it is beyond time. In that sense, Future Smart is much broader than, than technology. Future Smart is also sustainability. It's fundamental to us as a company and to us as an industry. For Anglo-American, um, we consider the whole in the entire mine, uh, mining ecosystem, from exploration right through to mine closure and rehabilitation, and considers the perspectives of all our stakeholders at every level. Where we can see value, we are keen to explore new approaches. A very, and an example of this is a very positive uh, dialogue with, with the faith organisations has been instigated by our CEO, Mark Cutifani, where he recognised that a lot of the um, NGOs were basically uh, associated with faith groups. And if we were going to have a different, organ a different discussion with the people that we work with around our operations, then we, could, we had to engage the faith organisations. That's been very positively received and has uh, spread basically to all religions. And a very positive outcome of this is, that is now we have shareholders from amongst those faith organisations so, and a dialogue and support from them that we again couldn't have imagined three years ago. Another area where future smart mining is co contributing to our sustainability goals is in the environmental sphere. Um, environmental footprint is really important to us and we believe that the industry and, and we can fundamentally change the, the, today's paradigm. One example that we're working on is the development of low emission technologies using platinum group metals, notably platinum-based fuel cell technology. We've developed uh, fuel cell vehicles for underground and trains for demonstration using our platinum-based technology. Global levels of investment in this same technology currently surpass billions of dollars annually. And manufacturers currently have vehicles on the market. In fact, in Paris a few weeks ago, I went from the airport into the city in a hydrogen cell driven car. There's, the development, again, in this space is on the cusp, of, I think, of an explosion. And we are, with our platinum uh, business, going to be a key, key player in that. 
In another early stage developing in, in the sustainability area, universities in the UK are working with De Beers, looking at mineral carbonation technologies to store large volumes of carbon in our kimberlite waste piles. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon and we believe that will certainly give us uh, substantial carbon credits. An area I think which is potentially rate limiting in all of this is our ability to bring the broader community along with us, uh, inclu including regulators. So how do we build up a relationship where we can change the world in a positive way much quicker um, than, than currently is, is than we currently can do because of the basic regulatory framework that we're working in. So it's an area that we need help on. Uh, basically, uh, we could put positive changes in around water today, but we can't do it physically because of permits. Finally, the employee of the future needs to be very, will be very different than the employee of today. The engineer of the future will not need to manage the equipment so much. That'll essentially be done by um, the robotics, by, by intelligence. The employee of the future will basically be the, the interface between the communities who are going to be impacted by the changes that we're talking about and our operations. In many ways, their job will more, be more around relationship management than operational management. Those types of employees today really aren't um, coming out of the universities in the format or form that we think that we will need in, in probably only five to seven years. So again, there's an associated change in the, in the educational uh, industry that we need to influence. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've given you some insight into the change that Anglo-American is, is, is leading. Uh, it is fundamental and profound. Uh, it is going to happen and we're going to be at the front of it. Thank you. <laughs>